Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your boy, Jay Mason. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Album Cover, where we take a look inside the ongoings of the music industry with those in the know, and we give flowers to those while they are here. And this person right here, he's no stranger to the podcast. He is the first ever repeat guest. It's my boy, L.A. W. Law, welcome back to the podcast, bro. Hey, man, I'm so glad to be here, bro, man. Thank you so much for having me as always, man. It's exciting. Thank you. No problem, man. I appreciate you taking the time out to come back and do another interview. Man, a lot has happened since the first podcast that we did on both our ends, so we're going to get into that. So, you were mentioning during part one that your family has history and The gospel realm, can you elaborate and expound more upon that? Oh, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, my late great uncle, the Reverend Professor Charles Taylor, and the Charles Taylor Singers were very popular on the gospel highway, which is the gospel version of what we call the Chitlin Circuit in R&B. So my uncle, which is, that's my grandfather's older brother. So the roots is already implemented that. Plus, my incredible aunt, Karen Pasek, incredible, I call her the jazzy aunt, because, you know, she's one of the first people I saw that adapted the whole Christian jazz philosophy. And honestly, to my incredible late grandmother, Beatrice Taylor, who was one of the lead singers in the choir of the church that we all went to called United Missionary Baptist Church, which was in East New York and not that far from the late great Reverend Timothy Wright's church, which is in the same area. You know, that's my roots. Gospel is first and foremost. I grew up in it. Um, Everything that had according to who everybody is and what they did, and no matter what genre of music, but the foundation has always been gospel from the very beginning and between everything else. The only difference is that we didn't grow up in bondage. We didn't grow up in the whole you're going to go to hell if you sing R&B. The difference with us is that we listen to everything in the house. Of course, you know, the risque stuff like NWA and all that, I had to hide that from my mother. But <laughs> but as far as in the beginnings of my family and, and how we were raised even in, in a Christian environment, as much as gospel reigns supreme, you know, my uncle David Sparks, Reverend David Sparks, he loved the temptations as much as he loved the wine. So we, we had the best of all worlds, man. Yeah, I come from a gospel family myself. My dad is a pastor down in South Carolina and mostly everybody else on that side of the family are involved in the church in some way, shape, or form. I grew up listening to the Williams Brothers, Jackson Southerners, Pilgrim Jubilee. Yeah. You know, that old AM gospel music. Oh yeah, all that, man. I was raised in that whole Brother Joe May. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And we take a look at groups such as Commission and how their sound uh, meshed R&B and gospel. I had a chance to interview Mitchell Jones and we were speaking on about how their sound pretty much influenced every male army group of the 90s from Jody C, Shy, oh, Silk, I mean, Boys and Men. Let me tell you this. I mean, we did a show with Boys and Men, I think in what, 2006? It was a corporate gig. It was us, the Element crew, Child Element, by the way. And Boys and Men was on the same thing. Now, of course, being the boy, but I knew that because if you read the line of notes like I did, which I'm pretty sure knowing you, you probably did. That is the common thread among Silk, Jodeci, as yet, especially those real rich harmony vocal groups. Because there are a lot of different R&B groups that had harmony and some didn't really put emphasis on it. But the main three has always been, for me, four actually, Boys to Men, Jodeci, Drew Hill, and Silk. I mean, I know I'm missing a few people in there, but those are the main four that always stuck out to me in terms of acapella harmony and using all five or four members to bring together that sound. You know, it's almost like our version of the Temptations, which we call New Edition 2 as well. But even in that sense, the harmonies were always different different from the perspective of that and that's because commission was so ahead of their time but you gotta remember look who they learned under you know same thing with take six i don't even put them in a the category no more the greatest vocal group i don't even put take six in the category anymore because take six was just such a that's a whole nother level like if you know notes and you're a tenor like me you already know what that means to you as a singer so i made sure i studied every aspect of that but commission definitely without question very influential and not talked about as much as they should be definitely that i mean there's something in the water with detroit because you have commission the clark sisters the whining oh, no. very influential not only in just gospel but r&b as well well keep in mind i mean you know the clark sisters and their cousin jay Ma. You know, I'm a fan of their father because Bill Maude, and they don't talk about Bill Maude enough either. Bill Maude is definitely without question. And, of course, not to exclude the Hawkins family and, and the Crouch family because they're definitely pioneers. But Bill Maude is definitely a pioneer in contemporary gospel. So the Clark sisters' success was never a surprise to people that knew the family that they come from. And you write about the water being in Detroit because the one universal record that Bill Maude had that became kind of a universal theme, you know, as long as I got shoes to put on my feet and... And I play 
wait for my children to read. Everything is going to be all right, be all right, everything. A lot of secular groups used to sing that song as their gospel song. Like the Temptations used to do it a lot. They would be in an R&B setting. That's how they would end their show with that Bill Moss classic. So it's relative, man. It's all relative. Right. And while we're on the subject of the Midwest, are you familiar with the band out of Oak Park, Michigan, Dream Boy? Oh, hell yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know yourself, man. You really dropping some jewels right now. A lot of people don't really know about those deep parts of it. So I'm definitely hip to those guys without question. Yeah, Dream Boy, for those of you that don't know, they were signed to Quincy Jones Quest Records. They mm-hmm. disbanded around 85, and wow. they're so balanced. I just want to know your name. Don't go. And I always thought that Dream Boy should have been just as big as Ready for the World. It's interesting, man, because, you know, in that era, I mean, we're talking about 85, right? The way I was, mm-hmm. I was a kid, but I was still studying a lot of that. As everybody know, I'm very intent. I remember stuff when I was four. So I can truthfully say, looking back at that era now, there are many artists and many groups that were left out of the picture or didn't get the promotion that they should have. Because a lot of times you're led to believe that if you didn't go platinum, you weren't good enough or you really didn't have a voice. Oh, they're not all that. Like, you know, and a lot of times what happens, especially in the black community, is that popular opinion is a very scary thing when people assume shit and don't really know what goes on in the industry. So, and of course, I saw it up front firsthand with my own family. So I'm more sympathetic to a lot of the guys that people don't remember right away. So you can bring up a group like that that I automatically remember, you know, having the record and certain people who did songs first that didn't hit big until somebody else did it or anything of that caliber. So it's a weird place, man, but that's the way the industry was at that time. And a lot of ways it still is like that. But the only difference is that now we have more power and more of a control and more of a say so thanks to the, the Internet and the fact that more artists have gotten smarter. Whereas me, I was already smart from the get go. That's why they couldn't stand my ass. Like I tell you all the time, they couldn't stand me because at 16 years old, you're not supposed to know about publishing and, and royalties and whoever the marketing guy is, if you're telling him an idea on how to market what you're doing, it's almost like, well, what do you know? It's, it's like the kind of attitude, like you're 15 years old. You don't know about this. I said, I know more you think. I'm not saying I know everything, but I know how I would like to be marketed to the public. And it's a lot of that that goes on. I mean, that's the reason why we have shows like Unsung, because it's almost like people never understood what happened behind the scenes with some of the baddest groups that either got a little bit of play, but then it kind of dimmed out fast or those that never got the push or the credit that they should have gotten so yeah right and i think that was back during that time when there were such things as regional records because i heard that i just want to know your name cut somebody had posted uh air check from wzak out of cleveland in the mid 80s for lovers only that was their quiet storm show and dream yeah. boy was a main staple and then i also think it was too ready for the world had the big co-time from electrifying mojo detroit legend out of wjlb absolutely Oh, yeah. Uh huh. You're right. Yeah, definitely a big cosign. And we're still going to stay into the Midwest. Tell us about She Can Get It, your collaboration with Jellybean Johnson, Monty Moore, and Tony M from New Power Generation. Oh, man. I mean, as you already been seeing, I get overwhelmed when I talk about it. I had Tony M on my podcast um, yesterday. It's unbelievable, man. It's a blessing. Like I tell everybody, the, for those who've been following my career this long, you know, me, Uncle Jellybean, and Uncle Monty, you know, we're friends first. And I think in this industry, a lot of times, you know, when you meet your heroes, a lot of expectations are put on it because, you know, you hear various stories about, you know, people not being so nice or, or collectively. So the first time I met my heroes in that aspect, you know, to go, I told my mother years ago, when me and my brothers, shout out to Justice, shout out to my brother Peppy, you know, we thought we were the time. So for me at nine years old, winning talent shows and performing Jungle Love in my uncle's church, to go from that to being in the studio and doing songs with them, opening up in them and jamming on stage with them, and now we got a, a hot record that's blazing right now that people are loving and going nuts over. It's just incredible. You know, it's just definitely a beauty personified. It's a dream come true twice. And then to put Tony M on it, you know, who's one of my rhyme heroes, you know, I knew what I was doing. Like, I knew I had something when I wrote the song, when I had everything together. But if it wasn't for Jelly Bean asking me songs for his album and then me saying under one condition, we got to put Monty and Tony on it, it would never happen. And shout out to Jeffrey Luna and Marty Bragg, of course, for facilitating that through all the connections that we made over the last couple of years and just did a lot of great business together so other than that rock with my heroes is amazing man this is what i live for this getting the co-sign from your heroes is better than any platinum plaque or grammar you can get and don't get me wrong nothing wrong with those things but um to me the 
co-sign of my heroes and the people who inspired me, that means the most because, you know, we lose our legends. In the last seven years, we lost our legends at a rapid pace more than usual. So give them their flowers and support them while we still got them here. You know what I mean? It's important to me. Right. I definitely heard the record, and it has that mix of many funk, but also a hint of that southern soul. Well, here's the thing. You just broke it down. She Can Get It is basically my personal love letter to the Minneapolis sound. Because truth be told, when Uncle Jellybean asked me for some songs for the record, I heard all the other songs he had did, which were all amazing. Like the stuff, the stuff that he did with Tracy Blake and me and Tamar Davis, the lovely Tamar Davis, Prince's former protege. We had great songs, but then I noticed something was missing out of all the songs I kept hearing. And I'm like, okay, everybody knows that Jellybean is diverse, but I'm like, we need a song that represents what people mostly know know you because if you don't know nothing about Jelly Bean Johnson like I said the diehards like me and you that know the history we know Jelly Bean you know drummer for the time Alexander O'Neill production crucial for new edition he produced and wrote Black Cat with Janet Jackson number one record across the board the diehard fans know that but people know Jelly Bean for that shit you know when he gets on them drums man it just makes everything dynamite in the real and if he's a key ingredient to why the time is still one of the most explosive innovative bands no matter which lineup you get so it's almost like I knew that we need a song. I was going to originally put that on my record, but when he asked for it, I just was like, this is perfect. I said, because out of all the songs I heard, he don't got nothing like this. As me and you both know, the Minneapolis sound is a combination of two things. Hard and street enough to make dudes make a funk face. You know, when that's, you know, when Prince and them used to get into that groove, you make a face. But it was sexy enough where the girls could shake their ass. So that's the balance of both. So when I wrote the song, I wanted to combine all of the elements of the Minneapolis sound while paying homage to all of the architects. You know, Andre Simone, Paul Peterson, Dev Dickerson, and the family, Maserati, the Jets. So I wanted to shout out all the Minneapolis icons that inspired the hell of me in addition to all the other artists who inspired me. So I'm glad that you heard that. I was purposely going for that whole thing. Somebody had said to me, this like, yo, it's got that Mars Day energy. I'm like, well, that's big bro, of course. I mean, if you're going to do a song like this, you have to present an energy. And Jelly Bean brought the whole Prince Revolution rock and roll guitar influence. But I really wanted to just kind of provide a song that represented my love for Minneapolis at the same time giving Jelly Bean a song that represents that'll have the fans that mostly know him for being one of the architects of that type of funk sound. Yeah, Jelly Bean is definitely the chili sauce, see what I did there, of the time. <laughs> The chili sauce, yes. The chili sauce, because I got a chance to see the lineup of the time about two years ago, my wife and I, in Albuquerque, and they were tight, especially when Jelly Bean was going into chlorine baking skin. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've said it once, and I'll say it again. Without question, it's the biggest compliment that any fan could have ever paid to me over the last 10, 15 years. I'm very glad when people can see the influence of Mars Day and the time, all seven original members members in tow and even the external members that have been around the camp for a long time shout out to Tori and Freeze you know those guys are all very influential on me from day one you know and it's part of like the top elite of the people who are my overall influences and that includes of course Prince, Stevie Wonder, New Edition, the Jacksons and you know definitely the time as well so it's almost like they never lose man no matter where you put them I mean that's what I love about Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis so much because the thing about Jimmy and Terry they're businessmen they change the production game forever as songwriters and producers, but them boys can put on the bass and the guitar at any given time and jump in with the fellas and still kick ass because it's like riding the bike. Once you're used to it, you ain't got to go around to it. Funk lives within you. That's what funk is. It's like all genres of music. It's either in you or it ain't in you. And with the time, it's never going to leave no matter which version you get. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Right, and it's crazy to think how the Midwest had such a big influence on the R&B sound in the mid-80s. I mean, Ready for the World, Dream Boy, but even the deal had to adopt what was going on in Minneapolis. And the deals, their albums, Eyes of a Stranger, the Street Beat album, Material Things album, you could tell on that production and the writing that Babyface is going to be a monster. Did, did you see my interview with Dow Simmons? No, I didn't catch your interview with Daryl Simmons. Listen, I mean, I'm still getting hit-ups about that interview because, as you know, Daryl, L.A. Reid, and Babyface, you know, they're my, my heroes, man. And it's crazy because that squad, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Teddy Rowdy, what they all have in common is the great Leon Silvers because he mentored all of those guys before they were coming into the game as producers and writers coming from their prospective bands. But that's why I love talking with Daryl because, you know, we talked about the man-child era when him and Babyface was in a band together because, you know, they're best friends from Indianapolis. But the thing is that 
when the deal happened, you know, when Babyface got in the deal and then Daryl Simmons was like an auxiliary member because he would play with them on stage as well, you know, he wasn't officially official part of the actual unit in terms of when they were presenting it promo-wise, but everybody knows that he was on deck. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about the deal album because you can hear the seeds being planted in that production style that would ultimately end up being the trademark that we would hear in every record that they did. That's why when you hear certain records now, you could be like, how could you not know that's not Babyface? You could tell by the percussion, by the vocal arrangements that Daryl and Babyface would do for certain artists. You know, it was all there. And I studied every last part of that. You know, that's part of my era. And I'm like, I got the old school stuff from my parents' era, but this is my era in the 80s and 90s. If I don't say the guys who's making waves and opening doors for me now how to hear as a producer and a musician, I'm going to lose when the 90s are over. So this is the reason why I'm able to produce and write for any style of music because they showed me that you have to have an ear in all facets to do that. So I'm glad you brought that up because the seeds were planted on those deal records. Those deal records, to me, make up and all. <laughs> we talked about that, you know, the whole androgyny thing and the curls and stuff. It's part of the 80s, man. It was part of the upbringing that would lead them to their success. So Yeah, yeah man. I mean, the album cuts on those albums was just as good. And then Babyface, when he put out the Lovers album, I believe, 86, on Solar, yeah. you remember the original cover with the balloons? That oh, album boy. was very, very good. I mean, Faithful? How is that not a single? And I believe that was Dee Dee O'Neal singing back up on that, I believe. Yeah, I want to say that. Daryl Simmons told a, a great story behind that album, too, because, you know, that album didn't really, outside of Mary Mack and a couple other things, that wasn't the album that would break through. Tinder Lover would be the one that would actually do it. But Daryl said something that was really, really crazy. He said that it's so funny because Babyface hated that album cover. And the crazy part was that he told L.A. Reid, as well as told our records, that he was never, ever going to tour again. See how that ended up. <laughs> After he had got Sheldon being a producer and a solo artist, he told the rest of the crew, I'm not touring. And, of course, as we all know, that became a lie by the time Tinder Lover came out. And here's the thing. Babyface doesn't have to tour. That's why you know he does it for the people. He does it for the fans. So. Right. Yeah, he definitely doesn't have to tour. He, like Smokey Robinson, can eat off of his catalog alone. Call publishing, bro. <laughs> and that's why artists never, ever sign away that. Nope. You got to know what your deal is. And the thing is that, you know, like I say all the time, I was a threat at 15 years old period because I knew too much and you obviously know why because I grew up in a family that's pretty famous in the industry so I watched what my grandfather went through. And at the time, I didn't know until I turned 15, because I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I still have the gold records from the BT Express work that my grandfather did with those guys. And, you know, growing up and learning about the music industry, I thought my grandfather was rich. Because, you know, I'm out in California. He has a house. He got all the guitars in the wall. Everywhere we go, people, hey, Sam, hey, how you doing? How you doing? I thought my grandfather was rich. And then the more I started listening to his interviews, I began to learn some things. And, you know, I learned very early. I knew the regulations didn't like me every time that they wanted to, to get involved or, you know, I start talking about, okay, can I keep my publishing or what's the royalty rate for this particular album if we do it this way or if I choose to produce it. And they didn't want me to produce myself because they knew that I would be keeping the majority of the money for myself as a producer. Because, you know, you bring other producers, they have to shop the money. And a lot of those guys are friends because they owe somebody a favor. My grandfather taught me this very, very early in the game is that most times they do that type of shit because they have to owe a favor to somebody. So they're, they're like, okay, well, no, Sam, you, you can't produce this one now, but we'll let you do the next one. And every time the next one comes, guess what? It'd be the same old fucking story. So I learned early. And then, of course, um, two guys named Prince and Stevie Wonder came along in my life. You know, not personally, but through learning about the industry and becoming an artist myself, I had to make a decision very early on. I'm like, well, you know, the more instruments I study, the more I expand my musical consciousness, the more I won't have to depend on nobody in the studio. Now, of course, you know, band-wise, that's different because you need a band if you're going to go out into the world and do some stuff and then even if you start to make an album with your band you can have ideas that you can bounce off of but it's still relatively your vision but the thing is just that I never wanted to be stuck in that because I knew business and I also knew that you know it's the expenses a band goes in and records next thing you know you're splitting eight different people and then you know that's how problems arise that's why the Go-Go's broke up the Go-Go's didn't break up because they didn't like each other the Go-Go's really broke up because two of the girls found out hey they're getting more than we get but that's because they wrote the majority of the songs and then there was nobody there to mediate or to have a discussion about who's going to write what or who's the better writer who gets to 
do this. It's a lot of that shit. So long story short, I really had to make some sound decisions, and I made them all by the time I turned, like, 13, 14 years old. So as they said, I was too smart for my own good. But as you can see, it worked out in the end for my favor because I own my publishing. You know, they if you did the interview last night with Tony M, I attempted to play Call the Law by New Power Generation, and my live got that. And I realized, I'm like, I forgot that they have restrictions. But I played She Can Get It because you know why? I own the shit. Me and Tony wrote our rhymes, and I wrote the music. So <laughs> they can't take me off of the shit that I own. That's the beauty of publishing, you know? Right. It is a gift that keeps on giving. And you mentioned the Go-Go's. You interviewed Jane Willen of the Go-Go's, and they have a documentary that's dropping on Showtime next month. August 1st. Oh, yeah, I can't wait, man. August 1st, man. The Go-Go's, I mean, shit. Where do I start about the Go-Go's? I mean, I think you saw that interview. Did you watch that one? Yeah, I caught it. It was crazy, man. You know, me and Jane been homies for a good long period of time. But even before that, as you saw in the intro, like I do on my podcast, with the exception of Sheila E. and, of course, Climax, the Go-Go's were the first female musicians I ever saw. Prior to that, I had never saw any women playing instruments. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a kid in Brooklyn. I'm learning. The Go-Go's, when I was in California with my sister, who was a huge new wave punk rock fan, she's the only Black Valley girl in, in a valley school that where we, where we lived at in, in Los Angeles. And I remember coming in the house, and there were these five incredible, gorgeous-looking white girls playing the shit out some rock and roll. And they were dope as hell. And I was turned on from then, and to find out that they wrote all of their own songs with the exception of a couple of covers, I was blown away. You know, they were definitely part of the 80s movement that really spoke to my culture, not just on the rise of hip-hop and new wave and heavy metal, but also in that type of field, too, where it's still good music. So the Go-Go's deserve their story to be told. They deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They should have been in there 20 years ago, if you ask me, because they are, without a doubt, the most successful all-female rock band, pop band of all time, period. So I can't wait for this damn documentary. It's going to be off the fucking hook. I can't wait yeah, for it. Yeah, I can't wait for that either. And then Showtime, they got a documentary about Duran Duran. When Duran Duran broke here in America, right. they were yeah. huge. And then once they got Nile Rodgers from Sheik to do the Notorious album, boom! Oh, that's why I love talking to you, bro. Jim, you know your shit, man. Duran Duran. Woo! Nothing says 80s like Duran Duran. When you think of the 80s, I think of two things that stand out the fastest to me. Duran Duran and Culture Club with Boy George. Because that's part of my upbringing, man. So even, you know, at the time, we didn't look at it as, oh, these guys just happen to be white. That's why I would say music is so colorblind, you know, regardless of the fact that, of course, all American music is derivative from the black experience without question. But it's still universally appealing to everybody that wants to sing, dance, and clap their hands as Stevie Wonder said in Sir Duke. But Duran Duran, I mean, shit. <laughs> and the fact that they have Bernard Edwards and Tony Thompson and Neil. That's what I love now, man, because now has his finger on the pulse. Like, he didn't get stuck at disco like a lot of people got stuck in that arena when things began to change him bernard and tony said okay guess what we're going to produce rock and pop records now david bowie duran duran madonna now you see why those guys are my heroes too because they showed me versatility they showed me don't get stuck in one spot don't get stuck find another way so i love it because you didn't even know what to call their sound you know you hear a couple of r&b influences for obvious reasons but they had such a strong pop sensibility like their hooks were incredible very quirky you know, Simon's voice, incredible. You know, they had the whole package, man. Right, and they were definitely a mainstay during MTV, and girls were just fawning all over them. Now, one guy from across the pond who I felt would have gone well R&B-wise, had he would have done some tracks outside the stop, Aiken and Waterman, was Vic Ashton. Uh -huh. That would have worked, too. That's another one that could have worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Never Gonna Give You Up was a smash. Together Forever was a smash over here. But I felt stop, Aiken and Waterman sound, their sound was just pure pop because they had success with Mel and Kim, who was a huge girl duo over in the UK. Then they took yeah. Kylie Minogue, who was an Aussie soap star, made her into yeah. a pop star, and they just had the formula of what pop was like going on in the UK in the 80s and 90s, but they had some elements of what Holland, Dozier Holland was doing in Motown in the 60s. It's all in compact, man. That's, again, going back to what I said before. Music is colorblind and then the appeal of a lot of those records that would ultimately become what they call the Euro pop sound, but, you know, Aiken and Waterman, like, they had again, these are producers that had their finger on the pulse of what was happening in the clubs. Let's get that straight because they would, you know, these guys 
or following. That's why I always say thank God for the DJ. The DJ is the first prevalent thing and relevant thing even in hip-hop culture. The DJ came before the MC did. The DJ is first. Shout out to Cool Herc, the father of hip-hop. Cool motherfucking Herc. Absolutely. Cool Herc. Right. If he didn't bring those woofers out in the Bronx and plugged up and started DJing, I mean, that's how hip-hop got started. The whole culture of it. I mean, everything else came into play like graffiti and breaking and all that other stuff, but the DJ is first. So you have to know, to have an ear of what's going on in the clubs and, and knowing what's up, a lot of those guys that were in Europe, you know, the, the DJ is kings in addition to live bands. Live bands are kings too, but in most places in Europe that course is over, whether it's Australia or London, I can't think off the top of my head from other countries, but DJ pretty much rule, and, and, and this is a perfect season for them because you can't really do any live shows band-wise. I mean, they're starting to do a little bit now at a time. They're kind of taking their time with it as we move through this whole pandemic. But the DJs have been the one that have been really profiting off of this scenario, too. You know, they have their finger on the pulse when it comes to that. So it goes to show you about keeping your ear to the streets, but at the same time, not losing who you are in terms of recognizing what type of sounds you like, what type of songs you like. And you remember, Kylie Noli had two different careers. People forget that. She had two different periods, you know? Mm, yeah, because like I said, she was in the Aussie soap opera Neighbors, and then once she got with S.A.W., she remade Locomotion, and she had I yeah. Should Be So Lucky, and then that just blew her up to where she would be huge. Oh, yeah. Huge, 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 huge. Now, I went back yesterday, I rewatched my favorite band, my second favorite band of all time, New Kids on the Block, do their Apollo performance of Please Don't Go, Girl, and oh, it just brings back to my memory of how yeah. when I when I interviewed Danny, he was telling me how grown women were just shot like Joey saying the mess out of that was so. And we got to thank whoever the DJ was out of Florida that played that on pop radio because, like we stated in part one, New Kids was originally marketed to R&B. That record was only pushed to R&B radio, and they did a version that only went to BT before. We got the black and white version that went on MTV, and I just think a lot of people now are starting to see, like, man, they are R&B at the core. As I've said on so many occasions, that's probably why I have a lot of Blockhead fans now, because as I've said on so many different occasions, in that time period of the 80s, you got to remember, the way things were set up demographically by Reculate. Now, keep in mind, it doesn't matter what age you were, it doesn't matter what race or color you was. You like who the fuck you like. That's actually one of my mantras. I don't have a guilty pleasure. I like who the fuck I like. So, Record Labels had this bright idea. Okay, new edition, black girl. Menuda, Spanish Puerto Rican girl. Of all the things, Hispanic, Latin, the whole bit. New kids on the block, white girl. And that came later simply because of the fact that, as Maurice Starr always said, they have finally figured out the audience that they have forgetting all about. Because keep in mind, there were no white groups of any caliber at that particular point. Not even the Osmonds. In the 80s, the Jacksons were still riding high as Michael Starr was starting to climb with the Thriller album and the Victory Tour would still make the Jacksons popular anyway because that's part of the whole collective. You know what I mean? Like he revered his big brothers enough to do that tour and it worked out on all all levels for everybody. So the Osmonds were doing country at that point. Donny Osmond was doing like shows and he came out with a record that went top 10, but there were no white groups of R&B or pop, at least ones I didn't know, and especially um, co close to my age group. So new kids on the block, you know, I used to see these comments that they've been getting in club quarantine with D-Nice and there were people in the like, yeah, we got to bring Donny to the barbecue. And I'm like, if you know the history of Donny Wahlberg and Danny Wood and the rest of new kids on the block, then you should already know that they've been to many black barbecues. <laughs> <laughs> these ain't just some white boys from Dorchester. These are white boys that spent their time crafting loving R&B music. People keep forgetting Jordan, Danny, and Donnie were part of breakdancing crews. They used to do graffiti tags. Like, this is not white boys trying to be black. This is the environment that they grew up in. They, that's why 90% of their audience was black before they got signed. People don't even understand that. It's almost like it's a foreign concept to them. I'm like, there's a lot y'all guys really, really don't know because that's really the basis of where their whole swag comes from. They weren't your average white kids from Dorchester. It, it wasn't just that whole thing. They were in the mix of all of that. So they tried to go the r and hip-hop route and it was working with a couple of audience. I mean, they had fans, but it just wasn't the same appeal 
deal that the record labels wanted until that DJ in Florida played Please Don't Go Girl. And that's the R&B record. As a matter of fact, that was originally written for New Edition. And I believe that because you got to remember, New Edition left Maurice Starr in the height of that particular run at the Candy Girl. And you got to remember, Maurice Starr was always writing songs. So I know for a fact, first of all, Please Don't Girl Girl, you listen to the, the whole phrasing of it, it sounds like, is this it? Please don't go, girl. Same type of shit. Maurice is a genius, man. I, I give credit where credit is due. He wrote the same kind of pop R&B bubblegum, and there's nothing wrong with bubblegum, but that was a time period. The formula worked. He studied Motown. Maurice is a Motown head. He studied the, the whole Motown blueprint and said, I'm going to give it. Candy Girl is a play off of ABC. You hear it? Candy Girl, you're on my world. ABC. It's idiot, one, two, three. You can hear it. It's like, it's so obvious, but it was dope because it was for my generation. So when new kids, it's the same shit, man. Those guys paid dues and then some. People don't even understand the hardcore dues they had to pay. And they have more to prove because nobody right at their record label gave a damn about them until Hanging Tough finally blew up. That's the true story. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't know the history, there's a video on YouTube of them performing for WILD out in Boston. I think the club was nine lands down and they had on um, matching Jordan tracksuits and that goes to show you that when they did the matching summer tour in stadiums that was easy because they earned it the hard way well of course I mean listen this is what I always say to people as we all know we're dealing in a very sensitive time right now where you can't say certain shit people get offended or they don't know what you're talking about or it becomes this I mean you know me I've never been one to give a fuck I am who I am and I speak what I speak but the thing with me is that um I've always said this that's why I never prejudge any White, black, Hispanic, whatever. If you've got the skill and you've done the homework and you know where it comes from, you're dope in my book. That's always been me. I've never had that premonition of saying, you know, oh, what? oh, what? Hey, he's white. He might not. I'm like, no, nope. listen to him first. Because, look, I mean, I'm a Daryl Hall fan. You know, we can go on and on about all the white boys we love. Remember, I was at that show. I was at the Apollo when New Kids first debuted. I was there. So the thing is that, of course, our faces were like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> Five white kids. Let's see what's up. And when they launched into the right stuff, I was convinced. I'm like, oh, these boys set this together. That damn Jordan Knight and his whole settle, man. Shit. And little Joey sound like another white version of young Michael Jackson. They couldn't lose. They, they really paid their dues to get to where they are. It was not handed to them. There was no white clippers involved. They came up the hard way and took all kind of roads to get there. So they had to prove themselves. They know that, especially in a world where they're going to always constantly be looked at at that particular time because, again, there were not a lot of white kids doing what they were doing. That's what made them special. That's why I talk about them often because there were a lot of white kids that weren't doing what they were doing. And then when they blew up, it was like, oh, shit. I mean, without question, if it wasn't for – New Kids on the Block, there would be no incense. There would be no Backstreet Boys. And there would damn sure wouldn't be no O-Town or 98 Degrees. They are the white boy catalyst of the future boy bands that came later in my era. Because once they broke up, that's when actually, as yeah, a matter of fact, Johnny Wright, who was to work for Ron Perlman, that's how he started. Because the guy that used to drive me kids around had an idea. He said, you know what? I didn't watch how they did it. Let me put together my own groups. So that's how he created Backstreet Boys and Insane. See how it all goes together? And then also Joe Jacket, who created Barrio Boys, was also in New Kids Camp. Had the same idea. I wanted to do the same thing what New Kids is doing, but get five guys that can do it in English and Spanish and capitalize on the Latin demographic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And they were no joke either, but a white guy who I felt should have blown up more, he actually opened up for New Kids on the Magic Summer Tour, Dino. That's the way it has to be, because that's the way I like. I can't. I was my shit. Are you kidding me? Me and my brother Chip, you know, back in the day, they used to have the, the video box request. Remember those? You used to uh -huh. on the video that you like the most. To be yeah. honest with you, that's actually why I know step by step, word for word. It's about in the beginning because we already knew Kids fans, but the reason why we love that song so much is because that Ice Ice Baby and Dino's I Like It, those songs were called in regular on a regular basis. Every single day, every five minutes, somebody played those records. But Dino was dope, man. Like Dino and Produce his own records, by the way, as well. That was my jam right there. I don't know whatever happened to him. I don't even know if he still does music anymore, but he was dope to us. We dug him. Yeah, I dug Dino, too. My cut on him was 24-7 because it sounded very much like night and day. Well, that whole album. The 
the whole album. I have it in my collection somewhere. That whole album was dope. Yeah, I have the 24-7 album. That was on for from Broadway. Then he put out the Swinger album that had Romeo featuring Dr. Ice from UTFO. And I think Dino is, you know, living regular life. He married Caroline Jackson from The Cover Girls. And their son, a couple of years ago, auditioned for on the show Boy Band what a group that later turned oh, out to be in yeah, real life. They, Excuse they me? Yeah, he's married to Caroline from the Cover Girls. Oh, okay. I didn't even know if they were still married or not. That's, I mean, not, not that that's an important thing. I'm saying more so, like, I didn't even know that he had married because, and like I said, he came out with, like, one or two or three albums. I know he did production work for a few people, too, but I didn't hear from him again because, like, I always tell people, when you don't hear from somebody again, it's either they walked away or they got so entangled in a bad, wicked-ass contract it prevented them from making new music. So I just always wondered whatever happened to him and a lot of other people too that were just dope as hell but Dino was definitely one of the golden exceptions of the white guys that had that soulful thing with them but they still managed to cross over the pop and still be themselves and Dino was being himself in that video right definitely because that video got a lot of heavy airplay on video soul that 24-7 and Romeo now there was this band that was signed to Columbia Records they were based mm -hmm. out of Buffalo New York they had a big crossover smash with Live and Learn and they were yeah. also playing back in live oh, on on the Uptown MTV Unplugged I'm talking about Joe Public. I know Joe Public listen that pissed me off when they didn't really go as far as, as I thought they should have because I knew that they were a band and at that time you gotta remember I think Nick Condition was already out Tony 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 was already killing the game at that particular point Joe Public fit right in they fit right in it was almost like that time period where now you had these bands of guys they're a little older than me but the thing was that they were presenting an alternative to the other groups that just sung and didn't play instruments. Joe Public only had like two albums. It pissed me off. Now I'm like, what the hell happened with that? They, right. They were good. Yeah, that first album, I wore that slam on I me. Mean, oh, I've been no. watching you, do you, every night. Mm -hmm. That whole album was bananas. And then also I want to swing back around the new kids because also opening up for new kids on that Magic Summer Tour was a young man who put out several albums as an artist, but he's also known for doing a lot of production work along with his brother is and that is Mr. Bobby Ross Avila. Wow. Well, I love talking to you. You like my boy Jason. He, he knows his shit, man. Like, we know the stuff. What's up, Jason? The crazy thing is that a lot of the tastemakers and the people behind the scenes are the ones that should be getting more credit than the people, not all people in front of the scenes, because you have to have the talent to make it happen, but I've always been impartial because I'm both. I'm in front of the scenes, but I'm also behind the scenes, too. And because I'm one of the few guys that can produce and write their own stuff and they can do it in any genre and get it done, it's different. So with Bobby Ross and those guys, that's why when I saw their names the first time working with Jimmy and Terry and all that and doing other stuff, I was like, hold up, that's the same I'm like, oh, shoot, that's what they've been doing now? Like, that, I love it. I absolutely love that because it's showing you once again, we ain't got to be in front of here all the time we could just write some dope ass material and, and win with it so this is just it's pretty a standard thing to see things like that happen there's a lot of artists who are like that you be people be very surprised they'd be like oh that's so and so from oh he wrote that oh he wrote you know and people just be very surprised about that a lot of these guys come from groups that we either heard of or some guys that didn't really perfect example i'm gonna throw one at you now i know you're interviewing me but i'm gonna throw one at you one of the greatest super groups that only has one or two albums was a group by the name of t you ever heard of them Cheese. it kind of sort of the bell. Okay, I'm going to blow your mind who's in this band. You ready for this? Go ahead. He featured Chipper Jones. I know you know who that is. Okay. Chipper Jones. That wrote I Want to Be Down for Brandy and Comfort Zone from Nelson Williams. That's Chipper. Chucky Booker. I know you know that name. Of course. On keyboard. And then you have the organ brother, Derek and Tommy, who played for everybody from New Edition to Michael Jackson. And then you got Derek D.O.A. Allen. That's T. They only had like two albums. They didn't really break up. It's kind of pivot away. But all five of those guys who I just mentioned to you have all went on to change the game as singers, songwriters, and definitely producers. Because I just mentioned the other names to you, like, yep, I know that name. They all started in that one group. They only had one or two albums. They were signed to Epic Records. It didn't surprise me when Kipper became the vocal coach and the vocal arranger and producer and songwriter for Kenny Lattimore. He wrote Never Too Big. All that stuff is Kipper. Kipper's vocal game is ridiculous. Besides his songwriter, I call him Uncle for a reason. That's one of my mentors. His ear for vocal arranging and phrasing and a lot of different things that singers don't pay attention to, 
He's part of that. Same thing with Chucky, because Chucky's very much like me. We play damn near everything except for horns, and we know how to put it all together. And then Derek and Tommy, who also songwrite, but their reputation as musicians, you know, is bar none. Look at what people that, who they play with. And then Derek D.O.A. Allen is one of the nastiest bass players, you know, from Captivity. And they're all from L.A., like the Los Angeles thing, you know? Right. And I'm going to throw a rare group that you may or may not know of, Cold Premier. Say it again? I didn't hear that one. Cold Premier. The name sounds very familiar. Very familiar. All right. If you look at the movie Class Act, you know the scene where they were in the school gym, the group that was Hold singing? Oh, that was singing? Yeah, that's done. See, okay. So I told you I would know. I said, but the name sounds familiar. I have the soundtrack. The guys who, you know what I thought that was? I thought that was a new version of Basic Black. <laughs> Right. Remember them? Yeah, basic black. Yeah, I never knew who that group was until years later. And um, you can go to wherever you can hear Beyond the Album Cover to hear my interview with T. Rob from Cold Premiere, and he explains why they didn't take off. And I'll give you a little little bit of backstory. Shane Sparks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's what he gets. Look, I'm learning more too. That's what I love about it. Let's go. Look, it. Shane Sparks, choreographer, former judge of America's yeah. Best Dance Crew, oh, was in that group. I didn't know he was in that group. Wow, you learn something new every day. Wow. Yeah, he was in Cold Premiere. So like I said, check out that interview with T-Rob. You get to hear the full story. And today, I was just going back to listening to the album by Good To Go. They were five girls, five the giant, head never satisfied. They were dope. And when I interviewed Natalie Fernie, and she was telling me, like, they came at the tail end when New Jack Swing was dying off and Hip Hop Soul was coming in. Then I think Giant kind of sort of didn't really know how to market them because they were full-fledged R&B toured out at the Apollo on Soul Train. They had Dr. Freeze, Spider-Man, and Hiram Hicks was their manager. Yeah, oh yeah. I told them not the Apollo. Good to go. They never taught, never satisfied with a dope record. And I seen them loud. They had it. Not to cut you off, but I was trying to say that to interject real quick. This is what happens now, what you see today, is when they take artist development out the picture. Because see, back then, you couldn't say that you were dope. You had to prove it. You had to show and prove. You really, you think you can really do some shit on the stage? And you didn't hit that stage until you were developed. Like, my grandfather didn't let nobody get on stage until he saw what you were doing and heard what you were doing. It was wasn't happening. Nowadays, they might just get up on there and be like, all that stupid shit, and nobody telling them, okay, you need to do something else because another guy is doing that. So thank God for artist development. That's why, you know, you bringing up these groups and bringing up this time era, I don't care what anybody says. Cheesy or not cheesy, it's very important because that's when artist development meant something. Your A&Rs and your record labels did not let you leave out of that rehearsal studio until that shit was tight, vocally and choreography-wise and band-wise. Period. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I agree. And that's to the point where how, you know how back in the day, a lot of singers, groups and stuff cut their teeth in school talent shows. Remember, talent shows was where you got your reps. Hey, look, I want my first talent show singing New Edition's Lost in Love. So there you go. And I want every talent show that I ever did. And even talent shows that didn't have winners but just wanted to perform and show your skills. So by the time I got to junior high, you know, I rapped one talent show and then I sang All in Love to Say About Evie Wonder and got a standing ovation. So, I mean, as I've always said time and time again, two places for me that cultivated that I, I mean, of course, you know, my family, they're cheering you on and people in my hood love it. They knew how dope I was. But the real test is outside of your comfort zone because in Harlem, nobody knew me at that time. You know what I'm talking about? Like, at that time period before I got to know Harlem as I got older. But nobody knows you. We're traveling to all these different places in New York doing shows, and I perform with my mother and my uncles and my aunts, and I got to step out here in front of people who I don't know at all. Singing Prince, James Brown, and New Edition, I had to have something. So I never got booed on stage in my life. So for me, that showed me, okay, Lord, you must really got something, because these people are really loving what you're doing. You haven't been booed off stage. <laughs> and, you know, they, they and of course, you you know, the girl even liking it. And of course, that always helps too. I'm, I'm not, I'm going to keep it honest. It helps because it's almost like, you know, that was my goal. I wanted to make the girl scream the way New Edition did. I wanted to make the girl scream the way Michael Jackson did. So it's almost like, you got to be right though. They ain't just going to scream for you because you bust a couple of steps. You got to, you got to come with it. You want to get an all form. So I knew I had to stop in my skill set. And the talent shows were definitely the gateway for me and a lot of my other family members too that did some of them with me without question. Mm, now, what Eddie Murphy said in Delirious was true about Fingers. I'm not going to get into the joke. Just look at that clip. You'll thank me later. No, we can get 
That's my favorite skit of all time. He, he, Eddie, that's Eddie Murphy in his prime. That shit is on, on Delirious, right? Yeah, it was on Delirious. Singers get uh, all of the you-know-what. Well, what, singers get, well, well, I mean, well, that, okay. <laughs> Oh, you talking about we said singers get all the, yeah. Yeah, they get all the you-know-what backstage. Uh, saying, how you doing? Fine. You're making me blush on Facebook. Here's the thing. I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm going to keep it PG. But here, I mean, I have to keep it PG, but whatever. But, um, I mean, to some degree, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. In that era, I would definitely say that was 90 to 95% true. But, honestly, in, in my travels and in, in my coming up, when I began, you know, doing my thing and, and coming up in the ranks, I promise you, it ain't like that all the time. A lot of people had to work for that. But back in that era when everybody was everybody, because once you had a record deal and you had a record out, you know, those things, among many other things, were very accessible. We know that. Look, we all mm-hmm. grown here. We can talk about it. We grown. It's almost like at that particular point, certain things are accessible. But Eddie Murphy definitely hit upon that lip because it was true. But he was making some very good points. And I said to myself, I said, you know, that's true. Because if Mick Jagger wasn't who he was, I mean, I don't think girls would have been running after. He didn't have that green idol look. That's why Big, remember, even Big, what Big he said in that song? Hot dog, never black and ugly as ever. He made, he made it clear. And I'm honest, I don't, I don't judge guys. I'm just making a point saying that he knew that he wasn't no Denzel Washington or or Wesley Snipes or guys of that caliber that had this real astute look because I can judge a guy without feeling fun. I could be like, I said, no, you got to look. He's suave. You know, his, his, sometimes the clothes can make can, can make you or break you too because you don't have to have the most popular screen out of look. If you dress to a team and your shit is sharp, you're more likely to get attention from somebody that normally wouldn't swing your way. I mean, what I saw growing up in the club, so I, I know this for a fact. You don't have to always look like the guy that all the girls would go for. So, it, it, so Eddie Murphy definitely has some truth to that, and, and that's it without question. It, that was, it still makes me laugh to this day. Right, and that what made me, Heavy D was dope, but just the fact that he was a guy with the big boy swag and can move. I mean, the girls were fawning and all. I mean, girls, the girls, they love me. Heavy D knew he had swag. That's my mother favorite rap so that goes to show you right there um heavy d from the, he's one of those guys from day one man i loved him from day one when overweight lovers in the house first came out and mr big stuff i'm like yo he's dope and that's the first time i heard about a place called mount vernon i didn't even know what money on the mount vernon was until i saw them and then of course you know later on pete rock and a lot of other guys i'll be sure that whole crew came out and changed the game so it's almost like heavy d you know they don't talk about him enough man heavy d was so important and not to mention him and i know some names of me right now but he's definitely one of the reasons why rappers felt comfortable rapping over R&B grooves because when hip hop really got big it was all about how hard your beats were and even the people like Houdini who did shit like One Love that had an R&B thing to it but still had that hip hop bounce when New Jack Swing came into the mix Heavy D's flow and the way he put words together and the way he could rhyme over the, and the speed that he had with his tongue over a whole bunch of different types of beats and flows it was captivating and the fact that like you said the fact that he could dance he could perform so so he had my vote from day one, man. I miss him so much. Heavy D, rest in peace. And Trouble T. Roy from The Boys, rest in peace as well. Yeah, because I felt heavy. He had the look that pop ad execs would go crazy for. I felt he should have been as big of a, like, Will, as far as his pop presence. He had that look. Oh, heavy? Heavy, yeah. Well, I mean, I put it like this. I think that's more of how one look at big or not big, because, I mean, he had four platinum records. And to me, I've always said this, you know, people People, people can say what they want to about Chief Sweat. You know, everybody's opinions vary. But Chief Sweat having seven platinum albums is not a fluke. When you have something that touches and gains your own lane and your own audience, to me, you're winning. You're not on Sunday to me. You're not somebody that can possibly do more because, you know, industry is very fickle. And I think that when Heavy D, when he started getting records that were going more gold than platinum, he didn't really have a care after that. I think he just really got settled in the fact that he was a hip-hop legend. He got a lot of hits. He still do shows. He's a hip-hop entertainment. He's producing people like Soul For Real and Monifa and making executive decisions and things like that. I think that he was very comfortable. Like, Keith Sweat is. Keith Sweat does shows for fun. Because he's another one that doesn't have to do live shows. No, but he's though. Keith Sweat very much knows what his power and what his lane was. He didn't never try to do anything that was too different from who he was. And I think that's the reason why he went platinum every time he came out. Right. And speaking of Keith Sweat, he discovered this little group by the name of Silk who had one of the Woo! top 10 singles of 1993, Freak Me, which was covered by Another Level. I mentioned them because they did a live performance from Apollo of Lose Control where Little G is playing on the piano. Alexa should have released that version 
and as a single. Let, let me say this, man. I get emotional when I talk about Phil, especially my big brothers, John John and Little G, because, and all of them, I love all of them, but I'm saying in particular as a lead singer, as myself, and especially first tenor falsetto and a natural tenor in the second sense and can jump anywhere. The diversity of Silk as a harmony group is not discussed enough. Them boys, look, I got stories, man. I've seen these guys gather around one mic opening up the show before they hit the stage to do their set right in Wingate in Brooklyn, in, in Brooklyn. And listen, man, like I said, I, I get choked up when I talk about those guys because I've seen them live from day one, up close and even from my television set and even at the Apollo when I was a teenager. And to have an ensemble that still not only resonated in harmony structure, the old school model of how to build a lot of different things upon harmonics, how to use their voice and how to use every part of the diverse part of their voice. I mean, it's to a song like Meeting in My Bedroom. People thought for a long time, before they started doing that record live, people thought for a long time, that can't be all them doing that shit in one spot. But when they did it live, I forgot if it was Apollo or BT, one of them things, you know, <laughs> really and then one one person sharing two parts so it, it's not discussed enough silk to me is the total package i mean without question they're huge influences on on my style and my style and how i approach i'm um, singing and building up harmonies and how to put things in perspective and the fact that they use their bass singer timzo you know a lot of you no know, think about it a lot of groups with the exception of boys to men during my period didn't have a lot of bass singers so silk definitely to the part because the you know timzo was brought up front vocally bass wise so a lot of different um silk records you can hear that balance between his bottom and john john first tenor falsetto and in between all that you know jimmy and big g and then little g being anywhere he wants to be in the mix of all of that so the boys don't get enough credit man still 2000 even boys are still killing shit vocally it's not better than they were before so. right and one group who um sadly the lead singer of this group passed away they were really good still doing their thing as a duo h town rest in peace dino h now see you talked about earlier about guys who don't get their props and should have went further. I love all three of H Town's records. They were dope. Especially Ladies Edition is my favorite, actually. That's my favorite one of all of them. But I love you for the flavor too. But Ladies Edition, would they like it slow? And some other songs I can't think of off the top of my head. Rest in peace, Dino. Very original voice. Nobody sounded like him. If you go back and listen to a lot of H Town vocals, listen to Dino vocals and Anthony Hamilton, they kind of have the same tone. That's that grit, that southern grit. That's that whole let not something back to me, make some good love. Like he had that, you know, he had he had that. Like that's just, and then his brother come in, good, back and back and back and back and boom. When that record first came out, and that's what anybody that knows R&B can, can vouch for me on this one. When knocking the boots came out, that shit, listen. <laughs> Dudes was playing that in a Jeep just to ride around the blast to test their speakers out. But, of course, it served another purpose, as we all know, which it should. <laughs> to serve the whole mm-hmm. purpose. Taking me back to that era when that record first came out, I'm like, yo, we was like, who are these guys? It was dope. It was snazzy. Then, then they had to have the nerve to, to have an intermission break in the record. What he said? Right like, now, we're going to be we, we on the intermission tip. So, ladies, go get your towel because it's going down like that. I'm like, yo. That was it. Yo, I love the 90s, man. I, I get, whenever we talk about this, I get so enamored and, and, and wrapped in that era because there was so much good stuff coming out. It's like a smorgasbord. You could pick any one of these things for any occasion, and it worked. But H-Town is definitely a group that, and Part-Time Love is actually my favorite song, produced by, of course, the incredible, iconic Devontae of Jodeci. Right. Which yeah. Jodeci made me proud because, you know, they're from North Carolina. I'm from North Carolina. Anthony Fantasia. Hamilton, Fantasia. I mean, that, that's what growing up in North Carolina would do for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to go into talking about a group who I felt should have blown up more. They were signed to Atlantic. They were from New Orleans. But I just think it was just maybe timing for them. The real production. They had a single called Ain't Nothing Wrong. Um, there were four guys. I think there were five originally. They went to a four-piece. Their hairstyle were kind of more of like 1950s doo-wop style. They did a commercial for Levi's 501 and oh. short-lived drink just, called 10K. You just blew my mind because this is a group I never heard of. See, you learn something new every day. I tell people this all yeah. the time. I learn something new every day. Because yeah. the only seduction I knew was the girl group. It takes you to make a they were high. I, yeah, I felt they should have blown up. I felt Shomari should have blown up more. They were signed to Mercury. They had If You Feel the Need. And then. Oh, Shamari. Uh, and then this group, As One. I know you know my boy Martin Kimber. He was in As yeah. One. Martin, I was about to say, Martin Kimber, 
Yeah, man. As one would definitely shout out to Martin Kimmer, by the way. That's, that's my brother for life, man. I, I love that guy, man. That's, that's my dude. Real incredible dude. Him and his wife and his beautiful daughter. They were another group, you know, very much on the heels of where Color Me Bad was, but I think a little bit more of a rugged operation, if that makes any sense. They had a little bit more of a thing to them, whereas with Color Me Bad, who are also a big influence, those are my big brothers as well, as you know. I love Kevin. I love Brian and Mark as well. And as you know, Martin was a part was with them for a while as well. Those guys had a, a very different kind of energy in what they were doing. I remember watching them on some program and hearing a couple of songs. I remember, I'm looking, I'm like, okay, I kind of see them falling in that category, but it's something a little bit different about them. So I'm glad you brought them up too. They deserve props as well. Absolutely. Yeah, because I interviewed uh, Martin, Jeff, and Sean. We were talking. I was telling them, like, yo, if y'all would have been signed to a better label because they were on Scotty Brothers and they were known for like Weird Al and stuff like that. I'm like, yo, y'all would have blown them more because Trust in Me was a dope record and then it took me a minute to realize that L.A. Dre was the same L.A. Dre that was on all the production credits on all the classic West Coast albums from Michelle A. to Dr. Dre yeah. so on and so forth. Here's the thing I was going to say to you. I think I said this earlier. Most groups that break up, dissolve, take a hiatus, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's a lot, it means a lot of different things these days. Some get smarter and some kind of, you know, I'm not going to disrespect anybody. I'm just making a point. You know, take, for example, one of my favorite groups of all time, Truth, the West Coast New Edition, without question. You know, in all technical aspects, Truth only really had two solid. I love the third album. Deeper and all that stuff was, was great albums too, but as far as the general public, all the hits that people know of Truth is from the first two out. Mama Cita, My Heart, All Do a Think of You, That's My Attitude, I'm Not Soup, you know what I mean? Like, you know, Spread My Wings. Those are the first two albums, but when the group started having issues and they were having problems with their label, Steve, you know, you know I gotta talk about Steve, Steve was smart enough to hang out with Gerald Levert and Chucky Booker. Because Steven Russell was like, let me start writing and producing. Which is the reason why, years later, he worked with a group called B2K and wrote the majority of their first big hits, as well as writing No Air for Jordan Sparks and Chris Brown and wrote Take You Down for Chris Brown as well. See what I mean? So some people are able to be smart enough to monopolize that when groups fall apart part because groups are not easy i'm part of one myself so i know groups are not easy you have to be either very secure with yourself and have other things going to where you know if god forbid if somebody wants to break up or the lead singer turns up missing or things happen you'll know what to do and how to expand your talent so people like la dre you know and the guys i mentioned earlier like hipper and chucky brook and all those guys these guys were smart enough to say you know what let me start doing some production and writing because to be honest with you that's where the money is anyway if you want to get technical the only money you're going to make being an artist or a performing artist is if you have something different to offer where people are hiring you. That's the reason, to be honest with you, before this COVID hit, that's the reason why I've been able to sustain my career the way it is because I get money off of publishing off of the records that I, that I put out myself, but because I'm an in-demand performer as a singer, as a dancer, as a musician and choreographer, because not many people that do all that stuff, that's why I've been able to make a living 20-something year on stage and being on the road. Because I brought something different to the agency that I worked for. Nobody was doing what I was doing, and there still ain't a lot of people doing what I'm doing. So that puts me in a bracket by itself. But a lot of other groups, they don't have them. So unless you're doing production and songwriting, or unless you go in a totally different direction as a solo artist, it's a weird place to be in. So that's why, you, you know, when you said L.A. Dre, I said, see what I mean? A lot of those guys, that, there's another one. John Austin, Austin, you part of a group before you started working with Jermaine Dupree. Brian Michael Cox. Like, all these guys were part of groups and playing behind people before they had hit records with, with all these different artists, you know? Right. And the thing about groups, like you said, is, a experiment in how can you be able to take yourself out of the equation and be able to be a team player because I know there's a lot of concessions that have to be made within a group even deep down to something that you don't want to do. Yeah, that comes with territory. I don't know if you saw the Eagles documentary. I'm a huge Eagles fan. I love those. Yeah, movies. I did. Big influence on me. Don Henley said it best, and I have to quote him because I can't say it no better than him. In a band, you simply cannot have five leaders. It does not work. I'm sorry. And anybody that says different, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Because collective minds, like all minds, change after a while. So everybody has to kind of know their role. This is why the Jacksons are incredible, even to this day. Because what people don't realize, not to often correct people, the Jacksons are a multi-talented family unit that just happened to have a lead singer who became larger than life. Because he was just that special. But you got to remember, when they made Michael Jackson the leader, 
year when they heard him sing the talent show. And they was like, oh, no, Michael, you're going to be the lead guy. There was never any jealousy or animosity because that's the way it was set up from the very beginning. Michael, you in the front. Marlon, you're going to be the extreme dancer, you know, anchoring your little brother. Jack, you're the oldest guy, so we're going to put you in the middle. So we're going to be the equalizer. Tito and Jermaine, you on bass and guitar. Jermaine, you're the co-lead singer. Jackie gets a piece. Marlon gets a piece. Tito sings bass. This is how the setup has always been. And then when Randy came in, Randy took it to the next level with him and Michael Jackson writing songs together for the later 70s period. It's an operating function. And Michael Jackson has always said that from the very beginning. Every time he tried to ask him about how him and his brothers operated, and he's always said the same thing. We get in the room, in the studio. If I have an idea, you know, Jack will probably help me improve on it. He'll probably add something to it. If I have a full idea that I don't want to include nobody, I'll put it there and be like, how can we make this work? They were a collective. It wasn't Michael Jackson and the Jacksons even though people like to say that shit a lot. They're a collective. And when it was time for Michael to leave and spread his wings, like he said before, my brothers have always understood this. He said it. If you look at his interviews, he's always said from the very beginning. My brothers know what's up. We had these discussions already. It's just some things I want to do alone, like some things they want to do alone. Jermaine was the first one to leave. People forget that. Jermaine was really the first person to leave, not Michael. And he didn't leave, leave. He just basically said, I want to do some things on my own. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can still be in your group. Look at Phil Collins. He did it for years. I'm going to do this. Look at New Edition. They're, everybody thought New Edition broke up. <laughs> no, that was planned from the very beginning. I remember, I'm glad they showed that in the movie, that that was already a plan when they did Heartbreak. Johnny Gill was already going to do a solo album. Velvet DeVoe wasn't thinking about it until Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis suggested it to them. Ralph already had a solo album finished that never saw the light of day, but he ended up doing another one that has sensitivity on it. So it's like, you gotta play your hand, and you gotta be smart enough to have discussion. When people don't talk, that's the top. Right, and I hate it when and the press and everything. When you're in a group, they try to single one person out. They're front and center in the photo shoes or everybody else in the background. I think that's where the dissension starts because you get the play on your ego saying, oh, this person is A1 and not supposed to be third string. Well, I mean, you know what that is? We were talking about this the other day. I forgot who it was I was talking to. It's probably somebody in my live scene now. But what I also tell a lot of the fans that don't know the behind the scenes stuff like we do, I also try to explain to them that just because somebody doesn't sing lead on every record that doesn't mean that they can't sing every group has a function and again it's down to communication some songs may fit the other person better some situations if a person is brought up with front and you're right because some record labels do do that they try to cater to the guy who's singing the most and Otis Williams said this a bunch of times when it came to Temptations he was like the problem was never with David's talent and him being one of the main lead singers it's just that David let people get into his ego phase he said you can see that every show oh you the best proper. They coming to see you. F them guys. They ain't coming to see them. And that's true. A lot of people feel the ego. And because you get fueled with that, unless you're careful, you start believing your own press. And here's the flip side of that situation. With all that ego shit that David Ruffin was doing, he's actually the one that had the least successful solo career. Think about it. He only had two records. Walk Away From Love and My Whole World Ended The Day That You Left Me. I mean, he had jams that people liked in between all that. But those are the only two hit records that come to mind off the top solo-wise when people mention David Ruffin's solo career. Eddie Kendrick had a bigger solo career than David Ruffin because when Eddie left, even though it was on some drama stuff too, but Eddie kind of left with a little bit more of, you know, I don't want to leave, but I'm going to be a little bit more humble about it. And Eddie had, what, three gold records? <laughs> That's not bad for expectations. You know, mm -hmm. one of them special solo career. So people, if you're not careful, you allow people to fuel the ego in terms of what you do of the popularity of your group because everybody deserves equal shine and then some people, if it's not being discussed, then problems happen. That's why Ralph said he couldn't understand why the guys were mad at him when the crowd was shouting, Ralph, Ralph, Ralph. You gotta remember, again, Jay, you gotta know your role. If you're the main lead singer, what every group has to know when a group becomes a group, if you are the main lead singer or one of the main two or three lead singers in the group, the bottom line is you're going to get the most attention. Period. No getting around it, no get, no getting over it, no getting under it. That's the way it is. So you have to be willing to either play your role, wait for your turn to shine, and that's just it. That's why I love Marlon so much. Because Marlon, I tell you all the time, I'm like, y'all don't understand Marlon's role. Marlon loves his role. Because as they got older, 
Marlon started getting more lead lines in certain songs and stuff. He's like, oh, shit, my said, yeah, they all could sing. But, of course, the attention was always shifting on the main two people vocally, which, of course, was Michael and Jermaine. You got, you got to go with got to go with the strong parts of it is. I tell you all the time, read Michael Jackson's autobiography. He revered his big brother. He revered them. Spoke about what made them a unit, not because he's Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Fuck all that. That's not even, dude, that came later. Like, Michael knew what his strengths were. He said in the book, he said that's the part of being in a group of your brothers is because we fed off of each other. People don't know that. All they see is, oh, it's just Michael leading the charge. I'm like, yeah, it's deeper than that, though. They're a group. Michael may be the lead guy, and of course, you know, he's a larger-than-life superstar, but the Jackson, like The Temptation, like New Edition, no matter how solo careers and all that shit happens, I've always said in retrospect, with the exception of Michael Jackson, no one man is bigger than the group, or at least as big as the group. Yeah, because I was thinking once NSYNC got their induction into the Hollywood Walk of Fame that it would be primed to where maybe you maybe talk about doing a reunion but I know the rest of the guys are probably down for it but I think Justin is probably thinking like mm, you know my solo career is bigger than NSYNC or I don't want to revisit that because I'm always looking forward never back not to cut you off, we'll go back to that in a minute. My boy Jason wants to shout out another dope-ass group who I know and love because they're on my favorite Lionel Richie album, which is Loud and Words. It was a group called 4.0. They were signed to Perspective Records with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Dumb boys were bad. Thank you for that, Jason. Dumb boys had a harmony sound like no other, and they only had one album, but they're all over Lionel Richie. Me and Lionel talked about that when I, when I worked with him in Hawaii. Like We talked about 4.0 featured on Say I Do and Want to Take You Down, which is two of my favorite songs on Allowed the words on. I just wanted to get that shout out. Of- Didn't they have the record um, Have a Little Mercy? I believe. Yeah, so, have mercy. Have a little mercy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, but that's what I'm, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I'm gonna put you off. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but back to what I was saying about in sync. I was yeah. thinking that after the induction on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, that it would have been the right time to maybe think about, hmm, maybe we should surprise the folks and maybe do something. It's called ego, and this is my opinion because I don't know Justin personally or any of that. But I've always said this though, and most of my fans who know me that have been following me for a long time, because they would get mad when I would laugh at the fact that. See, that's a different scenario. That's a different group scenario. Because look at the Backstreet Boys. All those guys and did solo records, but they all had great solo records. But even them, they even recognize. Yeah, we got solo shit that the fans will buy and love, but it's really been about the group. Now, in a case like in Think. And I'm going to tell you why this is. A lot of people hate me for this, but I, I'm a realist. And I know the background of these groups. I don't know them personally. In Backstreet Boys, all five members sang lead. And, and think there were really only two lead singers, which is Justin and JC. Period. Even if other guys had turns singing lead, they weren't main lead singers. Whereas on the Backstreet Boys record, on most Backstreet Boys records, you're getting all five of them sing, taking part. Like in Vogue. Sometimes in Vogue would have two. Sometimes one person will lead. Like Cindy would lead, hold on. But then you'll have a song like Live where all of them get to sing lead. And it's about a weird balance. So NSYNC was a little bit different because what was told to me was that when they did the Celebrity album, that was mostly Justin's production, as a matter of fact. And it is strange because on the song Gone, I hear more of him than I do the other guys. I don't really hear the guys that much in that record. So I think that it was something that he was planning from the get-go. And once he achieved the super, super global Justin Timberlake status, it's like, it makes sense. He's like, well, why would I want to join my former guys again? Remember the reunion they did on the MTV Vanguard? when Justin got the award? It was a short set and I that think they were so saying they were planning on a longer set but it just felt like to do trash. something so it quick. Trash. It was trash. It was rushed and it was trash. I'm like, thank God I never paid no money to get up in these joints. If you want to do a reunion set, he would have been better off doing a real set with the guys and then doing all of your solo shit. You need to study Michael Jackson more. See, Michael was smart. When he did the 30th anniversary, which is the last time all six brothers were together on stage, Michael was smart. He said, to launch off, even though it's celebrating me as a solo artist, to launch off my performing for the night. Everybody that performed for me and paid homage to me, I'm going to set it off with the shit that started me off. Me and my brothers. They killed that shit. Then Michael did Billie Jean and all that other stuff that people wanted to see. That's how you do a reunion if you're going to do a reunion. Make people believe it's sincere. 
my homegirl Fabiola worked with Michael Jackson on, on that show. So she told me the behind the scenes stuff in their rehearsal. She was like, man, people don't even realize how much brothers they are. Like they, they're really it's like it was like a, like a lot of jokes. They were messing up on steps and figuring out, laughing and loving on each other. And people want to hear about drama. I'm like, no, it's no, they're brothers. So it's the same shit. Well, it's like a forced situation. You know, I don't blame Justin if he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to do it. But NSYNC really kind of relied, in my opinion, on the vocal shoulders of him and JC. So what could they possibly record now and if they did do it I would be very surprised but again they weren't to me they weren't built like that Backstreet Boys was built more like a group they operate as a group not one person saying well I'm the main guy and this is what's going to happen and every thing I saw is Justin and JC I couldn't be wrong I never heard Chris sing lead on the record you got Joey I never heard Joey sing lead on the record yeah Chris is primarily building in most of your highs but you're right it's primarily Justin and JC as co-lead and it's about value because here's my take watch this I'm gonna make you laugh this is how you know it's built upon one person because look at a group like New Edition look how many solos Ronnie and Viv them got throughout the course of the 30 years they got more solos on New Edition records than Chris and Joey do on NSYNC records. <laughs> and they'll tell you in a minute, because I'll tell you what's coming. He's like, oh, I said, no, Ronnie and Biff can sing. They, they, they'll tell you in a minute that they're not supreme lead singers. You get them a couple of lines, they'll hit it. They leave all that to Bobby, Ricky, Ralph, and Johnny. They know, like, the strong singers in this group, y'all know who those guys are. Me and Ronnie, we get our couple of lines, we finesse it, we, we do our harmonies and shit, and we're good to go. I love when Ronnie and Biff sing lead. Yeah, that's the one thing that, I, like you said, everybody in the group has to know their role. Mike, Ronnie knew their roles. Mike said, hey, man, I just get my lines in, hit my little four, five, six, seven, eight steps, do my little talk on the intros, and I'm good. Yeah, that's what, but that's what makes, but see, again, that's what makes a new edition record a new edition record, period. If you've been following from the beginning like I have, then you would know. Then you automatically know what to expect when you rip open that packaging of a new edition CD, the same way I know what to expect when I buy a Silk CD or a Boys to Men CD. It's the same shit, bro. Mm -hmm. Same stuff. And then I want to close out this interview on talking about the Planet 12 podcast, which you can find exclusively on IG. How did that come about? Well, you know, for so many years, and people are probably on my Facebook will say this, for so long, people have always said, you know, Law, you're such a historian. You're a walking encyclopedia. You need your own radio show. You need your own podcast. And I always would tell them, oh, I'm definitely planning all this when the time is right. Timing is everything. And the thing for me was that, let's keep it real, with the exception of you and a few of our other buddies who we all know, like Derek and all those guys, I love all y'all guys, y'all are the golden exception to the rule because your podcasts are not boring. We talk about fun shit. But the general consensus of a podcast is what we're doing right now. You don't see us talking, but you hear us talking. So I always say, unless you're talking about something exciting or something interesting, it's going to be a boring-ass podcast. Let's keep it real. It's going to be boring. It's going to be corny. Who wants to sit there and listen to two people talk about nothing? So interestingly enough, like I said, with the exception of y'all guys, I knew that if I was going to do a podcast, that if I do a podcast, it's going to be more conversational with my heroes who just happen to be close to me. I'm not close to all my heroes, but the ones who I'm close to, you can automatically tell. That's why I had Nokio and Kate first because we're best friends you know we got an alliance <laughs> me and james from go go known each other for almost 15 20 something years it's a different state of mind me and daryl we're starting to get close you know we, we weren't close prior to that he's just somebody you know i admire you he's one of my heroes he loved what i was doing he showed me love and blessed my podcast you know so it's a different thing so how funny i'm looking at all these other people doing um interviews on ig live and that's when it hit me if i'm gonna go on live because you know young, everybody knows that the only time i come on facebook or instagram live is if i really have some Something to say. I'm not the average artist who just comes on here and just want to run his mouth and show me, but hey, look what I'm doing. I'm going to the bathroom. You want to come with me? He's like, no. I don't. A lot of artists do that. I'm not in. I don't just go on live to go on live. If I'm going on live, you're going to get political. You're going to get social. I'm going to give you something that drops in my spirit. Or I'm going to talk about music all day or even play some music just to have fun with the people who could be in and quarantine like I am. So right upon that moment, I said, you know what? I think it's time to do the podcast now because I wanted people to see us talking. I want people to see the real facial expressions between me and my people when we talk about music and songwriting and production and different things like that. But it's sincere because, again, they can't see us when we're doing other boring-ass podcasts that don't really talk about.
about much, but then it's almost like answers drag. Perfect example. When you interviewed Danny Wood, remember I told you how much I loved when you introduced yourself to me and you first told me who you was and I flipped out? Remember I flipped out when you told me who you was? Yeah. Why did I flip out? You remember that. I said because, what I said to you remember, I said because surfing YouTube, a lot of people do interviews and shit and they ask the same boring ass question and here's a guy, remember I didn't know you at the time, remember that? I didn't even know you. I said, right. yo, whoever this guy is, I'm like, this dude knows what's up. I would do his show in a heartbeat. It's funny how things work. I end up doing your show <laughs> and the whole bit. So there's a lot of inspiration in that because I basically want to take what me, you, and Derek, and Ron, and all those guys who I introduced you to and people who we learned through each other, I want to take how we do things and bring it to an IG Live format. You understand what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. honestly, doing the interviews with you, like you interviewing me, it helped definitely put a, a bat- an extra battery for me to want to do it on IG Live. Because I'm just like, now we get to do the type of shit where I can ask Nokia about how he wrote Beauty. Nobody never asked him that. They, they forget how much shit Nokia did in Drew Hill. They forget. That's why when I had Tony M last night, we talked about a lot of stuff about him and Moni Love writing the whole Carmen Electra album. See what I'm saying? Like, we, we talk about stuff that people know or want to hear more about. So I want to have a real conversation. I don't even like calling my shit interviews now because it's almost like I'm asking questions, but we're also having real conversations, and then we share a couple of stories because me and Case and Nokia, we have quite a few adventures together, so we can tell certain stories online and have fun with it. You know what I mean? So that's what inspired the whole thing. It's been very successful for me. It's doing great. Um, the numbers are climbing every time I do an episode. So, I mean, we got something different and unique, and I'm happy about that. The fans are loving it. They're being edutained. That's edutainment, <laughs> you know. So it's a different type of film. Yeah, it's doing that. Right. Definitely check out Planet 12 Podcast exclusively on IG. You can check out my boy Ron and my boy Derek. It reviews and done their podcast on the respective streaming platforms. And you can follow me on Anchor. Breaker, Stitcher, Spotify, Facebook show page, Facebook.com slash Beyond the Album Cover. And just this week, Beyond the Album Cover just got added onto TuneIn Radio. So you can definitely tune in to hey, all those hey, outlets to get it. That's what's up. Wow. So any shout outs you want to give, bro, before we wrap? I want to just shout out, first and foremost, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, just for the amount of success and just being a blessing and making sure my soul and my spirit is all right. Because in the end, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you know, how many plaques in the world you have, how many awards you have. If your spirit ain't right, you ain't built for this music industry. I'm a true industry survivor. I'm still here. I still feel good. I still look good. And I'm still kicking ass. And of course, the fans around the world that continue to support and hold me down. That's what I do most of this for besides, you know, the, the welfare of my own children, of, of everything else, because this is a grassroots movement. It started from nothing, right in high school. So it's almost like to go from high school, drafting Planet 12 in my notebook, to having people shout it out on platforms, to people yelling out, Lord, yelling out my trademark wherever I go, or tagging me in profile photos and finding old clips of me I don't forgot about, you know. So shout out to the fans and all of my musical heroes, um, the ones who are still here, the ones that have left us and passed on because we're keeping their legacies alive too. So that's pretty much it. All right, and uh, go ahead and drop your social where people can follow you. Okay, well, they know this, but we're going to say it anyway because we have to say it, don't we? <laughs> yes, you do. Twitter, at Planet 12 Law, Instagram, at Planet 12 Law, Facebook.com, slash Law Planet 12. And I'm on your Spotify and iTunes, too. That's L asterisk A asterisk W. You can find me on Spotify and iTunes. So there you go. There you go. And also, I want to big up two other friends of mine that got podcasts going, my boy Twin, D-Twin Radio, my boy Desmond Johnson, and... And the Rundown Sports Carolina Monthly, Believe in Carolina Panthers podcast, and the Pit Stop. You can catch their perspective podcast on all streaming platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, part two interview with my brother from another mother, Law LAW. Thank you once again, bro, for stopping through. Thank you so much. Plan 12 is upon you, bro.